The Bible tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It says to receive with meekness the implanted Word, which is able to save your souls, and to be diligent to present yourself approved to God, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. Join us now for the 3ABN Sabbath School panel. Our study today is Feed My Sheep, 1st and 2nd Peter. Hello and welcome to our 3ABN Sabbath School panel. My name is John Lomakang. We're so glad that you've taken the time to join us for this thought-provoking continual study through first and second epistles of the book of Peter. It has been a tremendous walk through this Sabbath school lesson, which the overall theme is feed my sheep. And the Lord calls us to be uh, faithful shepherds and leaders to feed the flock that God has placed us over. And we are going to enjoy our time today as we talk about the topic of false teachers, uh, June 3 to 9. If you'd like a copy of that lesson, go to absg.adventist.org and download lesson number 11 and follow along with us. But if you don't have one, uh, we'll do our best to keep you on track with us and we surely do appreciate everything you do for this network as we go and grow waiting for the coming of our Lord. So good to have our panelists with us today. Molly, good to have you here. Thank you. Pastor Tom Ferguson of the Marion District, good to have you here. My fellow colleague in ministry. Nice to be here. And Jill Marconi, good to see you, Jill. Thank Jill you. is uh, a staple here at 3ABN in a wonderful way. And Shelley Quinn, good to have you here as always. Thank you. Uh, before we dive into our lesson, though, we always like to begin with a word of prayer. Why speak about a spiritual topic without asking for spiritual help? Amen. Pastor Tom, would you have our prayer for us? Heavenly Father, we count it a privilege to once again come together and break bread mm. with one another. We thank you for your word and the food to our souls that it is. And as we study this lesson today, we invite your Holy Spirit to give us understanding. Be with each one of us in the panel um, with our thoughts and with the things that we say. And Lord, may you indeed feed your sheep through the discussion that we have in mm. Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, each of us is going to cover a different day in the lesson. And I have the privilege of talking about not only the overview, but false prophets and teachers. Uh, you know, I'll just say to my panelists, there is never a time that the truth of God is being uh, proclaimed that there are not on the grounds mm -hmm. in the audience someone that opposes what you say. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. And so for those of you that may be in the position as teachers, pastors, leaders, Sabbath school teachers, maybe even just uh, mothers and fathers teaching their children, mm -hmm. we live in a world today where every time the truth is proclaimed, there is some kind of opposition, whether it's evolution versus creation, whether it's atheism versus Christianity, whether it's uh, false doctrines within the church that are coming in to challenge the true doctrines in the church, whether it is the Godhead versus the Trinitarian views, whatever it may be, there are all, always uh, false doctrines that will challenge those things that are true. You know what, when I worked in the bank, I worked in about four or five banks in New York City, an insurance company, all in the Wall Street area. And what I learned very carefully was, it is easier to spot counterfeit money mm. when you spend your time studying the real currency. That's good. That's mm -hmm. good. Uh, now that we've had an opportunity to travel around the world, my wife, uh, Angela, she, she collects all this currency from all the countries, anywhere from a five pound note in, in Great Britain to a hundred million dollar note in Zimbabwe, uh, which in fact is no longer even uh, a viable currency. But the point of the matter is, wherever we go, there are different interpretations of what the Bible says. And the apostle Peter was concerned mm -hmm. that the church would be hampered by false teachings coming into the church. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to begin with the words of Jesus. Let's go to Matthew chapter 24. Because the Apostle Peter is really functioning on what Jesus told him would already be. The Apostles, and later on Paul, and we have Barnabas, we have Silas, uh, we have Mark, John, and uh, all of those that were faithful to the call that God placed on their lives were always exposed to an atmosphere that Jesus said would exist. Uh, how amazing it is. We talk to Matthew, we talk about Matthew chapter 24, which in fact, we commonly know it as the signs of the end. But look at Matthew 24, verse 4. Matthew 24, mm -hmm. verse 4. A very short passage, but very potent. 
And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one does what? Deceives. Deceives you. No one deceives you. Deception, in fact, is the staple of our day, the staple of our day. Did I say staple? <laughs> I meant to say staple. The staple of our day is deception, uh, counterfeits. Uh, I remember years ago, we have rhinestones instead of diamonds, pleather instead of leather, all these fake materials. We have composites instead of the real thing. And such has been the case when it comes to the truth of God's word. The apostle Peter pointed out that as long as there are sheep, there will be wolves. Mm -hmm. As long as there are shepherds, there will be those false shepherds yes. seeking to steal away and mm -hmm. come in mm -hmm. and bring about heresies that are not supported by the Word of God. Sunday, as a matter of fact, brings out, uh, I, I would say in a beautiful way, a complete picture of what the church was like and what the church is like today. Look at Second Peter, and we're going to follow through. Matter of fact, what we usually do is we often read the memory text together, don't we? It's not too late to do that. Let's look at the memory text for our week. It's Second Peter chapter 2, verse 19. And since we have our Sabbath school lesson, we'll all read that together. Can we do that? Mm -hmm. Here we go. It says, They, they promise them freedom, freedom but, but they, they themselves, themselves are slaves, slaves of, of corruption. corruption. For, for people, people are slaves to whatever, whatever masters them. them. Wow, what a powerful text. Yes, it is. Reminds me of Romans 6. Whatever you yield yourself, you become yes. servants of that one whom you obey, whether to righteousness, uh, which leads with sin Obedience. that leads to death, or, or righteousness Obedience that leads to life. That Obedience, that leads, Obedience to that leads to righteousness. Whatever you yield yourself to, you become the slave. And I like the word slave for one particular reason. It says that when we think that we are in control, we're really not. Mm. Either the devil is working out his will through us because we have been taken captive by him to do his will, or God is residing in us who both wills and does of his good pleasure. Mm -hmm. uh, I said to someone once ago, uh, not too long ago, uh, there is no yellow line in Christianity. You know, we have a two-lane road here going in and out of uh, Thompsonville, and there's a yellow line. And uh, I saw this ridiculous years ago when, when comedy was fairly innocent, uh, The Honeymooners. Many of you in America may know Jackie Gleason and Art Carney were the two uh, that really were major focus in that particular program. And one day, uh, Jackie Gleason asked uh, Art Carney, which was Norton in the, in the show, he says, what's the purpose of the yellow line? And Norton said, everyone knows what the purpose of the yellow line is for. Well, the purpose is to separate one side of the traffic from the other. And Norton said, the yellow line is for the motorcycles. <laughs> well, the fact of the matter is, no one travels on the yellow line in Christianity. You're either going north or you're going south. You're either going east or you're yeah. going west. You're going to light or you're going to darkness. Mm -hmm. You're going to truth or you're going to error. There yeah. is no yellow line yeah. when it comes to Christianity. The Apostle Peter brings this out carefully. Look at 2 Peter <coughs> chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. And this is the overview, in fact, of the atmosphere that the church existed in and is existing in today. The controversy and the context of the false teachings. He says, but there were, past mm. tense, also false prophets among you, among the people, even as there will be mm. false teachers among you. So there's nothing new. It was, it will be. Who will secretly bring in destructive heresies even denying the Lord who brought them and bring, and bring on themselves what kind of destruction? Swift. Swift. Swift destruction. But here's the sad reality. And many will follow their destructive ways mm -hmm. because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed by covetousness. They will exploit you with mm -hmm. deceptive words. And this is amazing. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle. In other words, they don't cease to be judging everything you say. There are some people, uh, Pastor C.D. Brooks, he's resting in Jesus now. Uh, he said, there are some times at the end of a sermon, somebody will come to him and say, Pastor Brooks, that sermon blessed me. Other times, people will say, I was so upset with you about what you preached. And they would take him to task on the sermon. And he said, I learned as I went on not to take offense. He said, because just like the sun, the sun melts butter but hardens clay. It's not the sun. It's not the light of God's word. That's the problem. It's the condition of the human heart. Mm. It melts butter, 
but it hardens clay. And it says, and so in this sense, there are people that never cease to judge everything that is being said. I think Pastor Tom uh, uh, made this observation. He says, to be on a panel here at 3ABN, to be on television, to be, uh, Shelley, you know this uh, to be a fact, and, and I think all of us have experienced this at one point or another, there's nothing that's said here that's not under serious scrutiny. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's why we have to make sure that we stay true to God's Word. Amen, Amen. for that? Amen. Amen. But it also says, and their, and their destruction does not slumber. In other words, somebody is always a victim of false teachers, heresies, deceptive doctrines. Mm -hmm. But there are ways, and I want to, you know, in the interest of time, I want to bring out, in a nutshell, uh, seven particular points mm -hmm. that this passage uh, emphasizes. Uh, false teachers will contend, they will contend with us as they contended with the early church. Mm -hmm. how, many, how many movements do we have within our own church mm -hmm. that have branched off? I don't want to mention them to give them any, any kind of popularity or any visibility or any notoriety, but in our own church we've got all these splinter groups that start one teaching or the other and pull people away after themselves. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I think the pulling away is easy when a person is not anchored in the truth. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to suggest is four ways that we could meet uh, and guard against eroding truth. Let's first begin with Romans chapter 16 and verse 17. And I'm going to read this from the King James Version, a very powerful text. Romans, um, Romans 16? chapter 16, verse 17. I'm going to read this from the King James Version. I like the way it, it, it uses... Uh, mm -hmm. The word that I want to emphasize is, is emphasized very greatly here in the King James Version. Verse 17, it says, um, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them. What's the word it uses in the New King James? Note. Note. Note them. In other words, put a note, but I like the word mark them, which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and do what else? Avoid them. Avoid them. You know, sometimes we contend more than we should have. We contend too much. When you discover that a person is not open to, to examining what God's Word says, and there are many instances, Molly, you know that. There are many instances where people will say, I know what God's Word says, but. Mm -hmm. That's how you can tell the difference between a sheep and a goat. <laughs> but. You know, I know what God's Word says. But I know what the Bible says about the Sabbath, but. And you have even and among our own church, Mm -hmm. There are people that contend with the validity of the Sabbath. There are some that have walked away from it. Uh, there are people fighting over the Trinitarian doctrine. There are people that are questioning the judgment. And unfortunately, people that are not grounded uh, become victims to that kind of activity. Mm -hmm. That's why it is up to us. Pastor Tom knows this as an experience. He's had some experiences in his district. We've had here in our church. You've got to say, this individual has no good approach or no good attitude toward this congregation. And sometimes you gotta name them, unfortunately. But you give them room before you go that far. But you have to mark those that cause division. The other thing you have to do is, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 and 26. And this is a little more, uh, I would say, if I could use the word here, this is more along the lines of how we deal with people that are willing mm -hmm. to listen. What about those that are willing to listen? How should we deal with those individuals that say, well, I just don't understand because not everyone, I believe, has vicious intent. Mm -hmm. It's just sometimes people don't understand. Mm -hmm. And sometimes because of that lack of understanding, they create controversy. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 to 26. Would you read that for us, Jill? Mm. Verse 24 to 26. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Isn't that wonderful? It says, mm -hmm. when you find somebody who's willing to talk, be patient with them. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes they only know but this much, and they hold on to that little bit they know, and they make an entire teaching out of it before. Uh, we've had experiences mm -hmm. where people have come to our church, and, and uh, Sabbath after Sabbath, Sabbath after Sabbath, they would make this statement in my Sabbath school class, and, I would, and then we would giggle afterwards and I'd say, don't worry about it, we're going to give you room to grow. 
what this text is in essence saying is give people room to grow. Mm -hmm. But in the process, don't leave them to grow among weeds that mm -hmm. choke them. But in love, instruct those who are in opposition. I think the King James Version says, who oppose themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there's a third thing. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23. If you have that, um, Shelley, 2 Timothy 2, verse 23. 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2, verse 23. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generally, or that they generate strife. How many times have you gotten to the place where you're frustrated? Anybody here? Mm -hmm. and, and it gets to the point where, you, where, where you're not waiting for them to stop and you're talking over them. Because what happens is it becomes a, a, a contention, a strife that becomes heated. I have, in this age of social media, I've had to take people off of my page that have used my page and as a platform to just spread ridiculous teachings that are not supported by God's Word. And so when you get to that place, try to avoid situations that continue to develop into a strife and a contending back and forth. One last one, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 to 4. Pastor Tom, I'll have you read this one. Um, 2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 to 4. Oh, wait a minute, Molly, you read this one for us because the, you have the King James I Version. Have the King James. I want it in the King James Version. Sorry, Pastor Tom. Sorry. Second Pre Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 to 4. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and mm -hmm. shall be turned into fable, unto fables. So that's what's happening. We're living in the same thing that happened in their day that's happening in our day. That's why when you have false prophets and false teachers, they've got to focus away from the things that divide to the one that unites, which takes yeah. us to you, the freedom we find in Christ. Freedom in Christ. Uh, we're going to look at deceptions of false teachers, and that's uh, Peter, 2 Peter 2, we're going to start with verse 18, then we're going to go to verse 19. Uh, let me read this to you, uh, 2 Peter 2, 18. For when they speak, beloved, great swelling words of emptiness, they allure. What does the word allure mean? Draw you they in. attract mm -hmm. or they charm you mm -hmm. through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. The NIV says they entice people who are just escaping. Hmm. You know who those are? Those are the young hmm. Christians, the young ones, the ones yes. that aren't yet settled and founded in the faith. And so they prey on, I can use that word, mm -hmm. they prey on the young. Now, how do these false teachers deceive believers? It's with great swelling words. They allure, they attract, or they charm through the lusts of the flesh. Mm. Now, Mark 14, 38 tells us, Watch and pray, mm. lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, willing. willing but the flesh is weak. Mm. You see, these false teachers use the very same tactics that Satan used to deceive Eve. And I want you to go to Genesis chapter 3. We're going to look at verses uh, 4 through 6. What Satan did was he appealed to Eve's lust. And, and the point I want to make, we're going to go to another uh, portion of Scripture, is that Satan has no new tricks. He has uh, mm -hmm. one way of uh, going after you to deceive mm -hmm. you. And uh, we're going to see this again, Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. Uh, Jill, if you're mm -hmm. there, will you read that? Then the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Okay, let's look in verse 6. Uh, remember the, the way the false teachers appeal to those that are young, not, not 
quite, not yet uh, got a solid foundation on, under them is they, uh, they, they appeal to mm -hmm. the lusts of their flesh. Now, the three areas that Satan appealed to Eve in uh, uh, the garden, verse six, and when she saw what would mm. that be appealing to? Right. The lust, lust of, of the, the eyes. eyes. That the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired. Mm -hmm. Lust of the flesh. And to make one wise, the pride, pride of, of life. life. Mm. That's good. It says, mm. she took the fruit thereof. So Satan appealed to Eve the same way these false teachers appeal to to those that they are attempting to deceive. Now we have, let's go to, um, going to go to Luke, the fourth chapter. We're going to look at verse one because <coughs> Satan tempted someone else. Mm. Mm. And now he, uh, he, when he came with his temptations in the garden to Eve, did she succumb to those temptations? Yes, yes, yes. she yes. did. Okay, now in the wilderness, that's Luke uh, chapter 4, verse 1, um, 1 through, um, I think I'm going to go through 4. Uh, let's start there. And Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the what? Of the devil. Tempted devil. of the devil. And in those days, he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterwards was hungry. Mm -hmm. And the devil said unto him, if thou be the son of God, command these stones to be made what? Bread. Bread. To make bread. bread. What was he appealing to? Hmm. His appetite. The, his mm -hmm. appetite. Right. And he goes on then in verse five. And the devil took him up on a high mountain and showed unto him the kingdoms of this world. And he offered him those kingdoms. He showed them to him. That would be the lust of the eyes. Then he takes them over Jerusalem mm. and he says to a high pinnacle. And he says, if you be the son mm. of God, cast yourself down because the, Bi the Bible says, the scripture says mm. that he will give his angels charge over thee. What would that be? The pride of life. life. See, mm -hmm. he enticed Jesus with the very three areas, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Those three areas that our early parents in the garden failed in, Jesus overcame in all three areas. Yes. So right. we can overcome as well. Amen. So let's go on now and look at 2 Peter 2, 19. We just read 2 Peter 2, 18. Now let's look at 2 Peter 2, 19. While they promise them liberty, what are the false teachers promising these young Christians mm -hmm. that they are deceiving? What is the, the enemy of these false teachers promising them? Liberty. Promising them, them liberty. The uh, title of my uh, portion today is Freedom in Christ. So these false teachers are promising them freedom. But it goes on to say, they themselves are slaves of corruption. Mm. Let me ask you mm. this. This freedom that they're promising, the enemy in the garden did what he promised Eve. Did it bring her freedom? No. no. What did it bring her? Bondage. It, bring, it brought her bondage. Who did that bondage affect? Everyone. It affected every one of us. We were all bought into that bondage. Mm -hmm. Now, when the enemy came to Satan in the wilderness, did he bring Jesus into bondage? No. Mm -hmm. Why not? Because Jesus overcame in every area. Amen. How did he overcome? The Word of God. It is written with That's the right. Word of God. And then at Calvary, I'll take this one step further, at Calvary, that bondage that Eve brought us into, that fall in the garden, what happened to that bondage? Was we, it was overcome. Amen. It was accomplished. It was broken. But let's go on. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. Mm -hmm. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. You see, these false teachers and anybody, they can only give others what they have. Mm -hmm. That's right. They can only give others what they have. What do these false teachers have? They have 
corruption. The only thing they can give you is what they have. With great swelling words, they are promising something they don't even have to give. Hmm. Hmm. And that's freedom. The only place we're going to get freedom is from the Son of God. And I've got to hurry. They are in bondage and the only thing they can give is what they have. Hmm. And that is corruption. What does Peter, Peter say? Whoever overcomes you, you are in bondage or hmm. enslaved and they are overcome with corruption. Now, Romans 6, 16. Mm. Do you not know? I think you, you, yeah, just, alluded to that. you just alluded to this. <laughs> Romans 6, 16. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slave to obey, you are the one's slave whom mm. you obey, whether of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness? If in Christ we have been set free from all bondage, why? Because Christ has freedom to give us. Mm. That's right. Because because we are sons and daughters of God through faith in Jesus Christ. John, 1 John 3, 2, I'm hurrying now, tells us, <laughs> Beloved, now are we the sons of God. When are we the sons of no, God, Pastor Tom? No. Right now, we are the sons of God. Galatians 3, 26, For you are all sons of God through Christ through faith in the in Jesus Christ. Okay, John 8, 34 through 36, and I'll end with this. <laughs> Jesus answered them, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin, mm -hmm. and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son. You're a son, beloved, now you are the sons of God, but a son, the, a son abides how long? Forever. forever. Therefore, in the, if the son makes you free, you are free indeed. Amen. Amen. So freedom in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Molly, you're fired up. I've got to cool you down. <laughs> She's preaching again. I'm says, preaching. Right? I'm She's preaching. to teach. Pastor Tom, I, I'm, we're, patching the, wow. we're passing the flaming torch to you. Yeah, let's see if I can keep it going here. But what a topic. A dog returns to its vomit. Yeah, you know, and I had several ways I could have gone with this, but I, I've been praying a lot about this. But one of the first things I think about, and it hit me real hard when you were speaking, uh, Pastor, is the seven churches. The original context was the seven conditions that the church was in That's after right. an onslaught by the enemy. Yeah. That's right. The original context. So you can see, if you, if you look at the seven churches, just see how much of your own congregation you're looking at. Mm -hmm. The condition that, that your church is in. We think of in a corporate, we think in the seven stages of the church. We think of us being the lady to see in church. But look at the seven conditions after a generation of hits from the enemy. Uh, because it's either of God or it's of the Nicolaitans. That's another That's thing right. to keep in mind. Because the Nicolaitan mentality is constantly bombarding the church. And it's really by the same enemy that, um, that has already been brought out, that is, that is behind all of this. I also thought about what about cancer? Um, as an, an analogy of what's going on. To all of us uh, have either experienced or know someone that has had cancer. Hmm. And it is this, I know I'm not a medical person, but I know that the cell just kind of goes rogue. The cells go rogue and they start to take over the body. So the surgeon goes in and tries to remove that cancer. And a lot of times people feel very confident that it is eradicated, it is gone, but the immune system is weak because really all of us have, as I understand it, precancer cells. We have right. our immune system is constantly keeping that in that disease in check. But their immune system is weak, mm -hmm. and eventually that cancer comes back in a more aggressive fashion. And I, I remember one soul, a precious soul, mm -hmm. that uh, she had cancer the first time and they removed it. She had cancer the second time and I was the pastor of the district at the time. They had, it was gone for several years. They were active in the church. The third time that cancer came back, it was, uh, they could not cure it. There was nothing. It was mm -hmm. rapid and um, it was a sad thing to experience. But oftentimes that's the way it is for the journey of a new Christian. And uh, the topic is a dog returning to its vomit. So what I want to do is I want to shift into a little different uh, focus because we've been focusing on false teachers and how they're having an effect. But I want to look at the journey of a Christian that is in an environment that um, is either in the church or in their own personal life mm -hmm. that is tearing, trying, attempting to tear them away from mm -hmm. the hole that God has in their heart. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew, the 12th chapter.
And we're going to look at verses 43 and onward. And it says here, uh, Matthew 12, beginning with verse 43, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. You know, when I, when I look at that verse, you're, you're talking about uh, demonic force that has actually right. had a control in this person's mm -hmm. life. It's gone. Mm -hmm. We have an infatuation in society today. We think that um, it's being entertained, the idea that uh, places are where demons want to possess. But no, they want to possess people. Yeah. That's That's right. Right. And when that is eradicated, they, uh, then he comes and says, I will return to my house from which I came, verse 44, and when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put mm. in order. Mm. And in other words, yeah, uh, there hasn't been the, the influence of this spirit, but at the same time, there hasn't been an, an influence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not mm. flooding the heart. It's an empty mm -hmm. house. And when that happens, then we find what, what the next verse brings out. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there, and the last state of the man is worse than the first. Mm -hmm. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. Wow. And I think about that, and I'm, I'm, because we have our own personal experiences um, that we go through, um, one of the things I want us to, to think about, it really disturbs me when a new Christian, um, after several months of being on fire for the Lord, all of a sudden, they're not there. But what disturbs me even more is sometimes people don't notice but they're not there. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah, one of the things we get accused of is uh, trying to bring in sheep and then forget about them once they're there. Um, maybe that does happen more than it should. But what, what, I, what I realize is when that's the case, what, what should the church do? Mm -hmm. there's, there's obviously something wrong. And as a result, the church needs to be praying for and reaching out to. Mm -hmm. They need to have a network, a community of church family, which is new family for them to hang on to because the enemy is attempting to take an empty house and fill it up with seven times what he had before, mm -hmm. to, to wipe away everything that God has accomplished in their, in their life. You know, I preached a sermon a while back. It, it was entitled, Feed the Lamb, Starve the Wolf. <laughs> mm -hmm. And Amen. that is something that all of us need to be doing, but a new Christian has a hard time maintaining feeding the lamb and starving the wolf. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have a lamb and a wolf in the same area, who's gonna win that battle? Mm -hmm. if, if wow. the wolf. Okay? You think about it, the lamb is the passive one, the mm -hmm. one is the, pre the prey versus the predator. So the predator needs to be so weak that it has no, uh, no effect on mm -hmm. the lamb. It's not a perfect analogy, but at least we, we see that Jesus needs to be the present one in our hearts. That's right. Um, also, I'd like us to turn to, to Luke 15. We're going to look at a story. I just want to take a couple of quick snapshots of a story that we all know very well, most of us do. And we're talking about the, the prodigal son. Because in verses 15 and 16, I want us to take a look at the fact that he had, he had that, uh, we'll call it a born again experience. He had that journey. But then in verse 15 of Luke 15, then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. When he took off, he took his inheritance, he left. But this is the point I wanted to bring up, is that he joined himself with a citizen of that country. Mm. Mm. It is so important to uh, guard your heart from a citizen from another country. A, someone who mm. does not know the Lord, don't let them have the influence in your life. Amen. Um, that, and this could be someone that is in your family, it could be someone that is in the church family even. Um, we need to guard our hearts because all they have to do, all they have to give us is what they know, as it was mentioned earlier. And what they know is, has to do with feeding swine. And when you think about the original context of this story, um, a Jew would not touch an unclean thing. That's right. But now he's living with and having to feed them because that's all there is around them. As a matter of fact, in verse 16, he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. In other words, that's a little closer to the spiritual food I was used to. Hmm but no one gave him anything. Mm. There, was, there, was no, there was no way they could do it. So they found themselves in this condition, this lost condition. So what does a person say that has maybe been overcome by uh, some of the things that happen in and outside of the church in their lives? Verse 18, I will arise and go to my father. They want to come Amen. home. Amen. 
And, and also in verse 19 it says, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. They feel unworthy to come to God and oftentimes they need us reaching out to them. Yes. Otherwise, yeah. there's no way to come home. And you know, we know the rest of the story, right? As his father sees him afar off, mm -hmm. he runs to him. Mm -hmm. And, and he just embraces him. That's right. And that's what the church family needs to be for those that are in that condition. As a matter of fact, some of us here that are watching or listening might actually have a son or a daughter mm -hmm. or a loved one that um, you, you raised in the faith and now they're, they're astray. And um, you know, this is, the, this is the condition they're in. They're feeding the swine. That's all they've got. Nobody yes. has anything to give them that they're needing. And um, we need to continue to lift them up in prayer because Amen. Proverbs 22, 6 is true. Train them up mm. in, the, in, in the way they should go and when they're old, they will not depart from it. They'll come home. Um, we need to be praying for two things that the enemy has ensnared. Number one, that God will make them miserable mm. away mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. like miserable that. away from him. Right. And the other thing is that the Lord will bring someone into their lives to bring them home. Amen. Amen. And um, I, I'm, the prodigal situation, now verse 18 through 24, I shared the returning prodigal's experience. This is what we need for all of those that have drifted away. Mm -hmm. um, a, a, per, a Christian who has a heart devoid of the Spirit of God is easy prey for the enemy of souls. Mm -hmm. And without Christ in your heart, your hope of glory, all we can do is return to our vomit. Yeah. That's right. And um, so we need to be sensitive um, as church leaders. Mm. You need to be sensitive to what's happening with the parishioners. And I just had this recently happen and I said, who has their number? And we were in a meeting, I said, who has their phone number? Who, and well, people started sharing the cell number and they're reaching out Praise yeah. Yeah. and they're, the they're loving the fold. Mm -hmm. They are sensitive to the fact that they're, they're under the attack of the enemy, that maybe someone got a hold of them and they're listening to someone that has drawn Amen. them away. Amen. So uh, that is what I had to share today. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Tom, that is beautiful. God wants to bring us, all of us, back to the fold That's and right. as brothers and sisters in Jesus who are in Jesus, he calls us to reach out to our brothers and sisters and then bring them back. Right. I have Wednesday Day, which is Peter, Peter and Jude. Jude. Mm -hmm. So let's turn back to 2 Peter. And we are also going to be bouncing between Peter and Jude. So we'll also go to Jude and keep our finger in 2 Peter. And there's uh, 2 Peter and the book of Jude address many similar concerns. Mm -hmm. They both address God's judgment and that he is in control of the destiny of the wicked. Many times we focus on God's grace and mercy and that is powerful. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, That's but right. that all should come to repentance. God is a God of love and of grace and mercy and is extending that door of probation for each one of us. However, there is a time when judgment will come. Amen. As Second Peter specifically addresses many of the false teachings that had crept into the church. There was the false teaching in 2 Peter chapter 1 talks about the second coming is a myth and Peter addresses that false teaching. This, the, the false teaching that prophecy of, is of human interpretation instead of mm. divine interpretation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now on this day we're looking at the false teaching that there is no coming judgment. And Peter mm. and Jude both address this false teaching. And so we're looking at 2 Peter chapter 2. And Peter takes three examples, three biblical examples of judgment of God, judgments that have taken place in the past. And we're going to read 2 Peter chapter 2, Shelley, you want to read verse 4. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Thank you. We're going to go to Noah next in the flood. So right now we're just looking at the first judgment that Peter talks about. He asserts the certainty of coming judgment by looking at the examples of judgment in the past. And this example is the banishment of the evil angels from heaven. They did not keep their proper domain. You see it says that there? Mm-hmm. 
and delivered them. No, that's in Jude. It says they did not keep their proper domain. So we'll go to Jude. But here it says he cast them down to hell, meaning he cast them down here to this earth to be reserved for the coming judgment, which will come at the end of the thousand years. Right. Let's go to Jude and we will look at did not keep their proper domain. Keep your finger in Second Peter. We'll be coming back to that. Jude verse 6. I almost said chapter, but there's only one chapter <laughs> in the book of Jude. So Jude verse 6. Okay. Uh, Pastor Tom, do you have that? Yes. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of that great day. It's very similar to what we see in 2 Peter chapter mm -hmm. 2. They did not keep their proper domain. They were not satisfied with their status. It reminds me of Isaiah chapter 14 and Satan there saying what? I will ascend to the sides of the north. Mm -hmm. I will be like the most high. Not keeping his proper domain. And instead mm -hmm. God cast judgment over them. They were cast down to the earth. Revelation 12 tells tells us how they were cast down to the earth. And then Revelation 20 talks about how they were locked up on the earth until the final judgment. Let's look at number two. We'll go back to 2 Peter 2. So the first judgment Peter talks about is the banishment of the evil angels from heaven. Right. The second judgment is the judgment of the flood. And Molly, do you have that? We're in verse 5, I think. 2 Peter 2, 5. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Yes, yeah, so here we see God's justice and mercy. He opened up the ark for everyone and whoever wanted to be, there were only eight people who chose to listen to the warning and chose to accept God's mercy and be saved in the ark. But we see the judgment that came upon that wicked world. And Jude does not talk about the flood. So we'll go on to the third, which is the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we're in verse six. Pastor John, do you have that? Sure. Second six. Peter two, mm -hmm. verse six. And it says, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them to destruction, hmm. making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. Yes, turning uh, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, seeing the judgment that came on that city. And at the same time, we won't look at it, but if you go back, you see the mercy of God too, mm -hmm. because he gave, remember, uh, Abraham pleaded with God and said, if you, there's so many righteous people, will you spare this city? And he said, I will. And then the number came down a bit. If there's so many righteous people, will you spare the city? And he said, I will. That's right. So we see that. And then in Jude, Jude verse 7, he talks, Jude as well, talks about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, in this case, it does not mean eternal fire that burns forever and ever. Right. It's showing that the, the judgment is irreversible and complete. That's right. If you True. go that's over effects. there, you know, that's right, showing the effects. So let's look at what are the sins that brought these severe punishments. We're going to look at the false teachers here. And there are five different ones. Hopefully we'll get through all this. We're going back to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. And Pastor, you talked about this, those who bring in destructive heresies. That's right. There were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. And then it goes on what those heresies are. One of those is destructive heresies. In the Greek, the word for heresies is a self-chosen opinion. Hmm. Ooh holding on to my own opinion or what I think is my own corner of the Word of God versus what God's Word really says. Another thing, those who despise authority. We see that in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 10. It says especially, well, verse 9, it talks about he's reserving the unjust for punishment at the day of judgment. And what are these unjust people? What do they do? Verse 10, especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They are presumptuous and self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of 
dignitaries, those who despise authority. We also see in that same verse, those who walk according to the flesh mm. instead of walking according to the spirit. So first, those who bring in heresies, those who despise authority is number two. Number three, those who walk according to the flesh. Number four, we're still in 2 Peter 2. We'll jump over to verse 18. And I know we've talked about this one before. When they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. They pull other people into sexual immorality, into sexual sin. And then verse 19, they become slaves of corruption. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. And the lesson brought on, I thought this was a fabulous point. Many times we would think those who are being judged, it's for some great sin. For going out and pulling a trigger and killing someone. Or uh, robbing a bank or doing something serious. But you know what? These sins, you could find them in the church. Would mm. you say that? Mm. Bringing in heresies. Pastor John, you talked about the different heresies that are coming into the church, despising the authority that God has placed us under, whether it's in the church, whether it's in civil government, mm -hmm. whether it's in your workplace, walking according to the flesh, becoming a slave of corruption. So what does God want us to do? I know I'm almost out of time. How do we experience revival and reformation in our own lives and in the church? Reformation follows true revival, and revival comes from God. That's right. So I'm going to give you an A, B, and C. A, allow God to change you. Surrender. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed Amen. by the renewing of your mind. That word in the Greek is metamorphosed, like a butterfly. The, the caterpillar crawls, and then the cocoon and chrysalis is formed, and then the butterfly emerges. A complete transformation. A, allow God to change us. B, behold Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory. That word for changed is the same word as it is in the Romans 12 too, metamorphosed. We are completely transformed by beholding Jesus. A, allow God to change us. B, behold Jesus. C, choose his way. Romans 13 verse 14 says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the lust to fulfill its flesh, flesh thereof. Amen. Amen. Ours overlap so much that I don't need to talk. No. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. The, the, um, I think it's wonderful. I want to just go back and there'll be a few little points that uh, you may not have brought out that I can go through. I'm, the uh, Thursday's lesson is the more Old Testament lesson, uh, more Old Testament lessons is what it's supposed to be about. And it said to read 2 Peter 2, 6 through 16, but I also went back to 4. Because what, what he's doing here is, as Jill has pointed out, he is showing that there is the inescapable judgment of the Lord is going to come on the evil. And, but he's also, it's the juxtaposition of how God judged the angels, how he, how he judged the antediluvian world, but he saved Noah and seven of his family members. So you see how God deals with those who reject him, how God deals with those who accept him. Same with Sodom and Gomorrah. But I do want to point out in verse 4, when it, uh, it talks about that the angels were cast down to hell, because there's so many people who try to use this to talk about eternal burning fire. Mm -hmm. The word hell here is a word that was used in Greek mythology it was Tartarus. Am I saying that right? Tartarus? Yes. Mm -hmm. And this was a, a deep abyss, a place where they were supposed to be tortured and, and burned. It is only used one time in the Bible, and what I believe, it's right here. I think that Peter is speaking figuratively. We know he is, if you look at the rest of the teaching mm -hmm. of the Bible on what hell is. But when he said that, uh, when, when he's talking about Sodom and Gomorrah and how God destroyed them with 
eternal fire. Now that's another thing that people get so confused over. In the Greek, the word for eternal is ionius. And it is relative to, it's a relative term. It's relative to the object that it's modifying. The Bible tells us that only God has immortality. So if you use Aeonius, everlasting, modifying something about God, that means it's without end. Hmm. But if you use that word to modify a mortal human being or a place or a thing, then the eternal means that it is only last as long as that thing lasts. So there's a destruction there. God will destroy in the end, the people in the eternal fire, they're destroyed. So the fire only lasts as long as it takes to destroy them. Just like you just read in Jude 7, that Sodom and Gomorrah are, are uh, an example to us of eternal burning fire. Well, Sodom and Gomorrah aren't still on fire. So now let's jump down here and um, I, I wanted to, um, I'll skip to verse 6, which is where I'm supposed to begin. Turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, he condemned them to destruction, making, this is Second Peter chapter 2, verse 6, making them an example of those who afterward would live ungodly. Mm -hmm. When, when you think of Sodom and Gomorrah, the, it's introduced in its first significant way in Genesis chapter 13. And how we're introduced to this is Abraham and his nephew Lot were working together. I mean, they were, they had all of the herdsmen working together and they multiplied. They became so successful that they had to divide because their herds were too large. The herdsmen right. were arguing. So what happened? Abraham graciously gave Sodom the choice, I mean, gave Lot the choice and said, you choose which way you want to go. And he chose the Jordan Valley and the Bible says that he pitched his tent towards Sodom. Sodom. Hmm. So what happens though, is that we see in Jude 1, 7, it talks about how they went after strange flesh. The word sodomy comes from the acts of the men of Sodom. And I want to be careful how I say this. Acting out on unnatural lusts is going against the order. It's, it's a consequence of going or rejecting God's created order. Right. I'll just put it that way. Mm -hmm. So, but Sodom's, that wasn't Sodom's only sin. In Ezekiel 16, we see that they had pride, abundance, abundance, abundance of idleness. They neglected the poor and the needy. They were haughty. They committed abomination before me. He says mm -hmm. in uh, Ezekiel 16, verse 50, they were haughty. They committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw fit. The city was destroyed and only Lot and his two daughters escaped this destruction. Mm -hmm. But once again, you see the juxtaposition of God judging the evil and taking away and, and, and reserving and mm. preserving the righteous, if you will, because it says righteous Lot, he was utterly disgusted with what was going on and he mm -hmm. just tormented his soul over what was going on. So it said, he delivered righteous Lot who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. So this demonstrates how God can rescue the righteous from trials and it, uh, I'm going to jump down to, well, I'll read verse 8. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless mm. deeds. And then it says, but then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. So we're going to go down to verse 10. Especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They're presumptuous, self-willed. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. In their uncleanness, in these defiling acts, they, they polluted moral purity. They despised the authority of Christ's Lordship. Mm. And they were denying mm. that, that Christ had bought them with the precious blood 
his own precious blood. And they were recklessly arrogant and defiant. And they were slanding spiritual realities that they did not understand. Now, there's different interpretations on this, but it's quite possible that it's meaning that they took the devil's power lightly. Because it says, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling, blasphemous accusation against them before the Lord. The angels were more powerful than these uh, false teachers, but they were maintaining discreet silence. It reminds me of Jude, again, verse 1 and 8, or verse 8 and 9, that says, Likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and they speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, and we know mm -hmm. that Michael is a name for Jesus Christ, right. in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, when he was wanting to resurrect Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling action, ac accusation, but said, the Lord mm. rebuke you. That's right. Ha! Huh. You know, one thing that we have to be careful in spiritual warfare, at one time I was taught to say, I rebuke you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> uh-uh, I don't do that. I say, the Lord rebuke you. Because right. if the Mi mm -hmm. archangel Michael wouldn't say, I rebuke you, he says, the Lord rebuke you, then I'm not going to slander these, uh, take this upon myself. Uh, verse 12, it says, but these... I'm looking at my time here. Like natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil things of the things that they do not understand. They were ignorant of the facts and they chose to remain ignorant. I'm back in Second Peter, by okay. the way. Okay. I'm sorry. Chapter 2 and verse 6. And will receive the wages of unrighteousness. They will suffer for their intentional verse wrong. Verse 13. 13. Thank you. Verse That's 13. Right as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes, carousing in their own deceptions mm -hmm. while they feast with you. Well, this goes on to talk about the things that you pointed out. What were their sins? But then the scripture goes, as you go down through verse 16, it's talking about Balaam and how he was rebuked for his iniquity. But the whole point of this passage is that for people who are wearied by persecution and you've got all of this going on in the church, don't worry, judgment's coming to those who defy the Lord, but the righteous will be saved. Wow. wow. Amen. This was this is such a concentrated lesson. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. I mean it's, I it, it could take a, actually a couple of weeks to deal with this lesson. One of the things we try to do here at, uh, at our Sabbath school panel is to awaken your thirst to, to really dive into God's Word. Uh, summarizing the lesson of the week, we are given the commission as leaders to protect against false teachings and to and to protect against false teachers. Also, thank you, Molly. Freedom is only found in Christ. No matter what anyone else tries to offer you, if it's not from Jesus, it's not liberty. Amen. Amen. Pastor Tom did that so wonderful. And I summarize what you said. New food re re removes the desire for old food. Mm. You won't really go back if you get the new food that's really nourishing in God's Word. Uh, Jill, uh, the need for revival and reformation, mm -hmm. how important that is in our church today. And Shelley, I could summarize, learn from the past. Amen. The Old Testament is not old stuff. It is solid food that will keep us and nurture us and strengthen us. If you learn from what they should not have done, you'll learn what we can do in Christ. Until we see you again, <laughs> may Jesus be your constant example and your guide. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Amen.